So welcome everybody, lovely to have you here. Uh, my name is Kate Robson-Brown. I'm director of the Gene Golding Institute, which is the University of Bristol Institute for Data Science and Data Intensive Research. Um, it's been my huge pleasure to have this role for nearly seven years now, and this is the sixth Data Week that we've run. Uh, Data Week is a, a collaborative activity taking teams from across the university, supporting research and presenting all kinds of um, talks, workshops, discussion groups, training events, and we'll, we'll come back to some details in a moment. Um, but it's, it's my privilege, I guess, to kick off Data Week as it is every year. And we've decided to this year to do this introduction online again. Um, that was something we started during the pandemic. Um, and actually we feel like it's a really nice and inclusive way of bringing together the communities that join us online for Data Week and also those that are here at the city of Bristol in the UK. And we know that we are able, if by, by doing this, we're able to, to welcome lots of our international uh, audience members as well. So you're very, very warm welcome to all of you. Um, as well as being director of the Gene Golding Institute, I am a professor at the University of Bristol in biological anthropology and engineering mathematics. So I have the joy of being kind of spread across across two faculties, and um, that gives me a wonderful opportunity to make uh, connections and, and, and networks with uh, specialists from a wide range of disciplines. And it's this multidisciplinary view, I think, which makes the University Research Institute model at the University of Bristol so special and um, so successful. Um, so you're here because you know this, but <laughs> I'm going to say it anyway. Um, Bristol Data Week is an interactive programme of speakers, training and workshops. Uh, we aim to showcase the latest in data science and AI, and every year we have a theme that runs through the activities. Uh, and this year, that theme is collaborating with communities using data and AI to create more inclusive cultures. So, so what I thought I would do today, after a little bit of a broad introduction, is, is just spend a few minutes thinking about some of the partnerships that we really value here at the at the University of Bristol and at the Gene Golding Institute and, and celebrate a few of those and raise the visibility of a few of those with you. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping before we start. We do have a code of conduct for online meetings. It'd be great if you could just have a quick look over that. Um, it'll The link will go in the chat just now. We are recording the event. I hope that's okay with everybody. We'd be really grateful if you could mute your microphone unless asking a question. I know that we've all got really good at this at this online um, netiquette or whatever people, people call it, um, but it's probably just worth reminding, uh, reminding us all of that to treat each other with respect. Do please enter questions as they occur to you in the chat box. We will try and leave a bit of time at the end um, to answer them. The, we'll pick them up at the end of the session. The team um, behind this today includes uh, Elaine Young and Kiara Singh, and they will be they will be there making sure that we monitor those those questions and can come back to you. And as I think I said in the chat, please do introduce yourselves as well. We'd like to make this as much of a networking opportunity as possible, given the given the medium. So as I said, the Gene Golding Institute is one of the university research institutes. Um, the others are the Brixstow Institute, uh, which focuses on creative um, industries and um, being human, the Bristol Digital Futures Institute, the Cabot Institute, which is focused on environment and climate change, Elizabeth Blackwell Institute, which is focused on health, and us, the Gene Golding Institute. But we all have a number of responsibilities and, and commitments as university research institutes, which are listed here. So, so really we're here, we're, we're constituted outside of the faculty structure, which gives us a great deal of freedom. It makes our institutes a kind of safe space where new research, where more risky research, where interesting new collaborations can be forged, um, where researchers from all disciplines and sectors can try something, try something new. Um, so we're there really to catalyze those new ideas. We have a small amount of, of, of income that we're able to push out to that community through, for example, seed corn funding. Um, we're there to help researchers and the networks that they create deliver impact out in the real world and public engagement as well. Really important, raising the visibility, creating dialogues, creating spaces 
where communities can come together to talk about the issues that we all think are important. And in doing so, of course, the URIs uh, promote and raise the profile of the university more, more broadly. And to a certain extent, we can also act as a portal for engagement. People come to us, out, out, external organisations come to us to find out how they can engage with the university. Um, we also do as much as we can to enrich the undergraduate and postgraduate student experience in various ways. So, for example, the Jean Golding Institute has in some, some summer internships for undergraduates um, and uh, many of the of the university research institutes also co-host, um, for example, research uh, masters. So we do have some common themes. We're fortunate and unique amongst the research institutes to be named after a colleague working with us today, and that is Jean Golding. So um, Jean is a, a very high profile mathematician and epidemiologist, and many of you, I'm sure, will know her work. She was the inspirational founder of the Children of the 90s Longitudinal Study, now also known as ALSPAC. Um, and um, as many of you may know, um, ASPAC data has led to uh, a number of breakthroughs in healthcare and the study of well-being. So, for example, led to a worldwide fall in the number of infant cot deaths following um, a, a, a kind of very high profile uh, research project. And we know that it's generated at the time of writing at least um, more than 2000 scientific publications. I'm sure they keep clicking in as we as we speak. Um, Jean is very much uh, a member of the university and we meet with her regularly to discuss ways in which we can kind of align our, align our ambitions. She may even be here today in the chat. <laughs> So um, Jean Golding Institute specifically, we have we have four, if you like, vertical um, research priorities, which you can see on this infographic here. And, and they are to support activities in data science and AI and intensive uh, data intensive research, which address societal challenges. Um, we work hard to promote methodologies and learning support for data visualization. I mean, maybe I should use a broader term here, not just data visualization, but data realization and materiality as well. Thinking about innovative ways of representing the narratives that we generate from data science. Uh, we also have a focus on good practice, essentially reproducibility and data governance. Um, and of course, we support the fundamentals, the foundational research that underpin everything that we do as data scientists. So that's more specifically found in mathematics and engineering mathematics and other branches of engineering like um, computer science. So, so supporting those and supporting the applications that arise from them. And, and we do this using the mechanisms that you can see in the horizontal arrows here. Community um, building events, just like this one. We provide training. Uh, we, we are the portal to the Alan Turing Institute, the National Institute for Data Science and AI. And we provide a surgery service called Ask JGI, where anybody research active in the university, if they have a data science query, can drop us an email, goes to our triage team, and we try and come up with a solution. Um, so uh, we have quite some quite focused um, kind of priority areas, but we, we, we have enough networking kind of um, soft skills around that really to be able to deliver a wide variety of support and, um, and research for the community within the university and the network networks we serve. As a portal for the Alan Turing Institute, this is interesting because the, the Turing, as many of you will know, has been going through something of a transition over the last 18 months to, to two years. Um, their wider mission, as stated on their website, uh, is the National Institute for Data Science and AI to make great leaps in research in order to change the world for the better. And that has remained like a North Star throughout the history of their Turing. But some of you may have noticed that recently there have new, three new grand challenge areas have popped up on the website. Um, that the, the decisions about those is the result of a, of, a, of a very broad and deep consultation exercise within the Turing family. Um, and they have now published these three priority uh, grand challenges, which align with national priority areas. And those are around defense and national security, uh, environment and sustainability, and transformation of healthcare. So those, if you like, they create new verticals of focus within the Alan Turing Institute. 
and all the member universities that are in that family of the Turing will be able to participate in those as they become more formal. I, I do know that each of them will have submissions within them and there will be opportunities for engagement um, within, within each of them. And then cross-cutting those are... Um, are themes within the Turing around foundational methodologies, so for example, foundational methodologies in AI, but also good practice uh, through a program that they call Tools, Practices and Systems. So some of you may have heard of the Turing Way. Uh, this is a, a kind of handbook of good practice that is developed by the Turing um, and you can freely access that information uh, on their website. So, so acting as that portal with the Turing Institute is, is, places us in a really interesting interesting position within the university we're able to to kind of open up opportunities to engage at that national level and to drive the agendas the discussion agendas at that national level as well if anybody would like to know more about that partnership and how to get involved drop a note in the chat and we'll respond to you um, but the Alan Turing Institute, this is an infographic I made last year, actually, but the, the Alan Turing Institute isn't the only organisation out there nationally, which is tasked, has been recently tasked with addressing um, dialogue around data science and, and AI. And, and this is not an exhaustive brain map <laughs> of all of them, but it gives you a sense of, of how, um, how fragmented, in a sense, the landscape is at an organisational level within, uh, within the UK. And this is before we start thinking about regional activities as well, or activities from um, individual nations within, within the UK. And, and, and it can be a very kind of a very confusing landscape, I think, if you're coming to it fresh. Um, it also means that sometimes the the kind of strategic priorities and the funding opportunities that are presented by this network um, are feel feel difficult to navigate. But we've we've been doing some a little bit of work on this, and I and I think we can really just distill it down into a few themes and priority areas that that are popping up nationally. So, for example, we're seeing a lot of discourse at that management level, that governmental level, about using data science and AI to unlock and unleash innovation in industry, particularly to unlock um, venture capital finance and other kinds of financing for new initiatives, uh, to facilitate that piece around translation, particularly from kind of university research into, into a commercial landscape. Uh, and there, there are, there's a lot of energy being, being spent at the moment thinking about what the best mechanisms are for that, uh, how universities and industries can, can come together to achieve that, that economic benefit for, for UK as a whole. And part of that growth requires and kind of fresh eyes on standards and regulation. So as we've seen, for example, the Island Turing Institute become quite focused on supporting uh, and regulate discussions around regulatory frameworks for data science and AI. And, and that's never been more in the public discourse than it is right now with the um, large language models that we're all, we're all becoming very, very rapidly familiar with. Um, there's also a sense that we want to distribute, we as a nation are keen to distribute these kinds of skills and benefits across the country. I've used the phrase leveling up here, but actually I'm, I'm hearing that less and less <laughs> now. Um, but there is there is a sense that this should be distributed, the benefits should be distributed across the country and not polarised into particular areas. And I think there's also a real concern around skills, and I'll come back to this later on in this introduction to think about something that we at um, the Jane Golding Institute have been working on the last few years to contribute to that um, skills agenda. There's increasing focus on international collaboration, and, and really it's um, this focus is not so much about whether we should or should not collaborate um, internationally, it's about it's about how we structure those partnerships, what's important about those international collaborations. So where should they be? Who, what kind of organization should they be with? And what sorts of topic areas should we be collaborating on? What consortia of countries or consortia of institutes should we be bringing together to, to address these really fundamental grand challenges that we're all facing today? And then under the, all of this sits underneath an umbrella that, that I, the, a message that I've heard at government many times, which is around promoting the UK as this science and, and technology um, superpower. And, and if you were to pull out the, the, the online descriptions of the research strategies for, for, for many of those um, organisations on that brain map, I think you'd, you'd find the same sorts of grand challenges 
kind of feeding up. So there's there's a lot of concern around environment, climate change and net zero and how we can harness the data that we, we currently generate, but it may be siloed, how we can make it interoperable, um, how we can use it for predictive modeling uh, in environment, climate change and planning for an opera, opera, operationalization for net zero, but also around the health and life and biomedical sciences and national security and, and defense. And then underpinning all of that is how, how some of those can be commercialized to create a really vibrant digital and data driven economy. So I think it's it's worth thinking about the activities that all those all those national organizations, but also local institutions like ourselves are, are contributing to, to that to, to this kind of wider vision for what data science and, and AI can contribute um, nationally. So our goal at the JGI is uh, to make data work for everyone. That's a tagline that we've been working to for, for, for many years. And essentially, we function as a, um, well, I've phrased it here, a think and do tank. Because I don't think we're just a think tank, and I don't think we're just a do, a do tank. I think we're something we're something in between. We're a place where communities can come together and raise the visibility of, of research and, and issues which are really important to the research community, but do it in such a way that it develops that real world impact. So we support um, both communities of researchers, but also their wider networks at a national, international level. And, and we support work which tackles both those scientific questions and also the societal challenges that run alongside them or societal benefit that can be accrued from them. So uh, one of the ways we do this is by offering training opportunities in data science broadly understood. So that is was everything from the kind of preparatory work that one does as one embarks on a data science project, thinking about the provenance of data, the ethics of generating that data, the governance around the storage of that data, uh, all the way through to analytics using artificial intelligence, machine learning and other kinds of methodologies to get the most out of it. And underpinning all that, of course, is research software engineering, which none of us could none of us could do without and all of us value enormously highly. And the sorts of opportunities that we want to roll out free at source are are really kind of embodied in what Bristol Data Week is and, and what you're all participating in. We try really, really hard to provide data science expertise for researchers at all stages of their career, both, both very early career, people just getting started, all the way through to established scholars and their industrial part, established industrial partners to, to, to galvanize that translational opportunity. Um, and um, what I'm going to do is show you a few, give you a few examples of, of, of how we've done that recently. We're a relatively small team, and this isn't absolutely everybody, but you can see we have um, a, a team made up of technical expertise from our data scientists and research software engineers and professional services expertise um, in, from, our, from our team of business support uh, people, for example, events like today and communications um, and all the office support that we need as well. So it's a relatively small team. I think we probably, I'm proud to say, I think we punch above our weight. And as you've seen, this is our um, Data Week interactive schedule for 2023. Um, you can see that some of the activities are online and some of them are in person. I hope that's clear. The ones with the little white stickers are the online ones and the ones with the little purple stickers are the in-person. Um, and we're, we're still feeling our way. So it'd be interesting to get some feedback on whether we've got the balance right uh, from you. Uh, obviously, we we moved entirely to online uh, during the pandemic years, and we're now exploring ways in which we can kind of retain the best of that for some kinds of activities and have uh, whilst also supporting in-person activities across across the university in the same week. Um, we've colour coded it, try and make it helpful. So you've got seminars in in orange training in blue and there's a there's a kind of timeline there's a sense of progression for the training across the year uh, sorry across the week and then the workshops as you can see in green so again we try to kind of share them across across the week to make it as accessible as possible and based on some of the feedback from last year um, we've also integrated some more social events just some networking events where people could people can drop in and come and talk to us about the work that we do or ideas that you have 
um, and we can we can discuss some ways in which we might be able to advise or or support you. So, for example, immediately after this session at eleven o'clock, we've got two parallel sessions. One welcoming our partners, um, Roche Diagnostics, to talk about their efforts around data culture, and another. Um, uh, drop-in installation and help session for the R and Python um, training, which is happening this afternoon. It's really good to get your hardware all sorted out for before you start that training, or you'll be kind of you'll be running to catch up. And then the afternoon, we've got a special edition of our Data Ethics Club. Our Data Ethics Club is a group which meets throughout the year. Uh, it's being chaired by Hugh Day, who is one of our new uh, data scientists, starting uh, starting with us later on this year. Very kindly agreed to to chair this in advance of that. Um, and if you're interested in that, go along um, because you will, you'll find actually that there are activities that you might like to drop in on at other times of year as well. And after that, we have Professor Ian Nabney, who is the head of school um, um, in engineering, uh, uh, giving us a, a talk on kind of workshop on the beauty and value of data visualization. So really privileged to have to have him coming and joining us this year. So I hope you find that there's um, a variety of activities that are, uh, are kind of what, what you need to support you in the next stage of your career or support your project. We're sure we haven't spotted everything. So if there's something, if, there's, if you have an idea for something that you'd really like to have next year, either that you'd like to work with us to deliver, or you think there's a, is a gap that we really need to fill, please do let us know. Um, as you can see from this, from this slide, all the, all the presentations, all the work that we do is done in collaboration. So um, many of these activities that you see today are ideas that were generated out of previous data week presentations. So that's that's the way it works. We work with you to deliver what the community needs. We have many partners in this. Um, here's, here's a few of them who have been very instrumental in delivery of, of um, Bristol Data Week uh, this, this year. Um, but we obviously have uh, many others as well, and I'll, I'll talk about a few of those uh, today. There's one particular project uh, that we'd like to, fl to flag with you, event that we'd like to flag with you, is our in-person event on Thursday this week at the Bristol Beacon. And for those of you who aren't aware, that's the same building as used to be called Colson Hall, um, renamed um, uh, quite recently. So that runs from 10 till 5. We're in the, for those of you who know the building, it's, um, we have, we've got the whole of the foyer with different activities happening on the different levels. But in particular, uh, we thought you might be interested in the panel session, uh, which um, I will be, I will be chairing, um, where we've pulled together some great speakers to talk about um, our theme of connecting and collaborating to create inclusive cultures. Uh, that includes one of our local MPs, Darren Jones, uh, Professor Matthew Studley from the University of the West of England, Joanne Boyce, Tom Appleby and Mark Woods from some of our collaborating and um, partner organisations. So really, really looking forward to that. I think we've still got a little bit of space if anybody would like to would like to come down and, and join us and meet some of these fantastic people. The same day we have workshops or so talks before this panel that we have workshops, for example, on the use of, of data science and AI for peace building and conflict resolution. So some really interesting activities there that directly relate to the theme of the week. And I'm sure you'd find it really, um, really enjoyable and informative. And then what can you do to keep in touch afterwards? Well, we have, we have a number of ways in which um, JGI is accessible to all of you. Um, so internal colleagues, so staff can apply for CCORN funding. Um, th those funds can be held in partnership with external partners. So although you need, a, you need a University of Bristol staff member actually to make the application, many, many of the projects that we fund are, are building those bridges with organizations outside of, of the University of Bristol. So it can still be for you, even if you're not a staff member at the university. You could join us entering one of our data competitions. We have different um, frameworks for, for social media. Join, join Follow us on Twitter. Uh, you could join our data visualization group, data biz group, which is chaired by James Thomas, or our data ethics group, which is chaired by, by Hugh Day. Or you could even just subscribe to our mailing list to find out about our future activities and events that we run throughout the year. So lots of ways in which you can kind of con continue the journey working with JGI after this week. 
Um, so just uh, for the last few minutes, I want to talk spe specifically about how we build networks and partnerships and why we think they are so important to uh, the kind of priority missions of JGI, but, but also I think specifically for, for data science and AI dialogue and kind of discourse publicly more, more broadly than that. Some of you may have come along to our showcase last summer, which we held down at the M Shed, um, which was again a bit of an experiment. We weren't sure how 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 people how many people were going to be up for such a busy and and, and vibrant in person event, but we were overwhelmed with the support. Uh, so this was a, a two day a two day event where we welcomed every partner that we have worked with in JGI over, over as it was that past six years, every project that we've supported, um, every external partner that we have worked with, uh, as well as inviting some fresh new faces uh, into the workshops and talks. We made it free and open to the community. And um, we had around 2000 people during those two days join us. And many of them had registered in advance, but I think quite a few, quite a few hadn't. We had quite a few walk-ins who were coming to the museum anyway, who came up to find out what it was all about, and then ended up having some great conversations with our with our staff and students as well, who were who were there on the day. And I th just think this is a really good example of how a university research institute like JGI can galvanise that networking, that public engagement networking, that embedding that we all need to do within the communities of which we are a part as kind of as part of us as part of our civic engagement we as a team learned so much from talking to the participants that came to that event um, i know that um, it sparked many new collaborations and new ways of networking uh, and uh, you know, there are projects that are being developed now that are are a direct result of the conversations that happened at that day I can't promise that we will do that every year. <laughs> I think you actually need a few years for the project kind of cycle to refresh, but we will be planning another one um, for the next in maybe in another a couple of years time uh, when there's a, when there's a new crop of projects and and students and and, and staff to to showcase. Um, and one of the things that we were able to to showcase a little at the um, at the at at the showcase, but it's actually part of a longer strategy was some of the work that we do with our international strategic partnerships. It was a decision that we made um, shortly after I became director those, those years ago, that we ought to develop some meaningful relationships with kind of carefully chosen international partners. Um, and after, a, uh, after some consultation, we focused on two and they are the Institute of Statistical Mathematics in Tokyo in Japan and Strathmore University Data Center in Kenya. And it's a, it's a huge pleasure for me this year to be able to say that we have welcomed um, colleagues from both of those um, institutions to Data Week in person this year. So um, we had a lovely dinner last night, we welcomed them, uh, and it was great to see, to see uh, people in person coming, coming to Bristol to, to join us in this celebration of data science and AI within the university and the region. Um, so it's great, they're both giving talks. Um, they're on the 9th of June at 10 o'clock, uh, uh, so that's Friday morning. Uh, one is one talk will be by Betsy Marithi, who is from Strathmore University and Data Centre in, in Kenya. So she's a research fellow at iLab Africa there. And her talk is on fine tuning large language models for accurate speech recognition for low resource languages using Mozilla Common Voice data. And then the second talk will be by our colleague from the ISM in Japan, Ayaka Sakata, who is associate professor at the Institute there. Who'll be, who'll be giving a, a talk on foundational models around inference with non-convex functions, actual performance and implementation. So we really hope that as many as you as possible might be interested in coming along to those talks because they're interesting in their own right, but also because it might give you an opportunity to think about ways in which you might want to partner with those organizations. Um, uh, I think building the bridges with the, these kinds of strategic partners is a really important thing that university research institutes can offer to the research community. We've had real success in doing that in the past. So for example, with the ISM in Japan, we've had joint seminar series. Uh, we had a lot of participation from the Institute of Mathematics here in the university. 
the focus uh, was methodologies and applications of geometric data analysis. Um, so we had several hundred people attending, including um, commercial partners as well. So it's a really nice way also of reaching out to some of our wider networks. We've supported postgraduate research. PGR stands for postgraduate research. These are PhD students, um, kind of interactions, knowledge exchange between the two centers. And we're now very happily planning a second joint workshop, an in-person workshop, uh, aiming for, Mar for May um, 2024. And that's something that IACA and I will be talking about during this week. And then uh, for with Strathmore University Data Center uh, in Kenya, we've run a number of programs. We, we joined them in 2019 for their version of Data Week. Uh, and we co-delivered some um, training, uh, some programming training, training and data ethics training and data visualization training with their community uh, out there. And, and the, the, the links that we made at that time have blossomed into a number of different funded projects. So these involve the, the vet school, kind of smart agriculture type projects with our partners, their partners, Rothamsted Research. They've involved the, the International Livestock Research Institute, which is which is ILWI. And we've got several partnerships with the with developed there that have resulted in funded PhD studentships, um, honorary fellows, and other kind of blossoming of the staff base to support that collaboration. Um, we've co-produced talks and training. We've participated with more recent data weeks that they have won, that they have run online. Uh, uh, we've we've worked on um, collaborative celebrations of International Women's Day, Women in Engineering Day, and just recently the university had their own celebration on international 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 partnerships. So, and um, our partnership with Strathmore was one of those that was celebrated in that. So we we feel this is incredibly important. Data science and AI re requires a multitude of ways of thinking and and diversity in order to lever the best benefit um, for uh, for research, but also uh, also commercial, and to avoid some of the hazards uh, of of data science, for example, around around bias. So we feel this is part of our mission to provide those bridges, to build those bridges with really high profile international partners across the globe in order to, to facilitate other researchers joining us on, on that journey and creating those, those routes for knowledge exchange, those routes for funding and partnership um, of the future. So, as I said, it's a huge pleasure to welcome um, colleagues in person this year, not something we've been able to do, obviously, for the past three years. So, so a particular pleasure. And I'm personally, I'm really looking forward to that event on, on Friday morning. And just to give you a little bit of a sense of the, of the wider project support work that, that we've done over the past few years, we were, we were gathering these data um, earlier on in the year for our governance board. But um, we, we, uh, by our count, we funded 69, this is just till the end of 2022, not including the ones for this year, but 69 projects across the faculty. So these, these are multidisciplinary projects by design. So they have to have some kind of element of multidisciplinarity. They have to be PI'd by a staff member of the university, but there can be, there can be partners from outside of the university. And they tend to be between three and six month projects. So these are, these are, these are projects which enable um, people to come together to have a go at something, to achieve something new, to try something new in a low risk environment. There's, a, there's, no, there's no concern here about fear of failure in inverted commas. I don't I ever think there is failure in these kinds of projects. But um, many of them have gone on to get external funding from other kinds of organizations, and some have gone on to have very high profile um, and impactful um, lives of lives of their own. So you can see that we we've supported work across the faculties um, in the university. We're working hard to build uh, um, uh, some more targeted activities towards um, the arts in particular uh, and in fact the arts faculty in the University of Bristol has been um, invested quite strongly in digital humanities recently so we're working with the, the theme lead for that Professor Genevieve Lively on a number of projects to, to, to kind of make sure that the benefit for this digital world that we live in the data data driven digital world is one that the arts and humanities researchers can also blossom in and we have had some success around that so for example it's just a couple of the of the displays that we used at um at the showcase last summer but you can see the one on the right there 
is, is a project which is um, uh, run by Professor Brendan Smith, a medieval historian here at the university and his uh, colleagues, uh, including a research software engineer and, um, and colleagues in uh, the National Library in, in, in Ireland. And this is looking at um, the relationships that are revealed by financial records from the from the medieval world. So there's a great deal of fundamental historical research that goes into this, but then we can also use the cutting edge data science uh, visualization and analytics and visualization tools really to understand the complex web of relationships between um, different individuals and organizations working at that time. So a really fascinating project and one that I'm sure is going to have um, impact uh, in the field. And I mean, one thing we might be able to do with that kind of project is to is to automate some of that um, some of that kind of analytics. And that's something that Brendan and I, Brendan and I have talked about over the years and we'll, we'll probably, probably revisit. And then very different example of a multidisciplinary project is the one on the left here, which is um, a project where JGI has had quite a long-term relationship with. Um, uh, it's a climate ar archive interactive. So when you actually go into it, you can't tell from a, from a static poster, but you can, you can manipulate that world. You can go forward and back in time you can you can visualize it you can see it you can see it moving you can see it changing and that kind of element of of animated data visualization i think is a wonderful example of how we can exploit tech to tell the stories to kind of to to transmit the narrative of the findings that we think are so important from data science and ai it's been a real pleasure to watch that project um, grow and develop and, and have, a, have a life of its own. And we continue to be really interested in supporting the team, the multidisciplinary team, which is geographical sciences, systems developers and research software engineers to, to, to get the maximum out of that, particularly in terms of public engagement opportunities. Um, but some of the things that we've funded um, this year, just, this is just a few highlights of, of projects that, that I've been particularly interested in watching grow. So we're involved in a University of Bristol professional services led with a PI being Anthea Terry project called Social Mobility Innovation Partnership. This is a civic partnership uh, project which is involving both NGOs, the council, the universities. Uh, and we're going to be looking at how um, interventions to improve opportunities for social mobility may or may not be successful. Um, and so one of our data scientists, Richard Lane, who I think is on this call today, will be involved in that project. At this point, mostly from an advisory capacity, you know, where, the, where might the data be? What can we do with it? What are the, what are, what are the outcomes likely to be? Uh, who are the partners that we need to be involved? So that's a really exciting new project, fresh, you know, fresh off the, you know, uh, a, a fresh funding. Um, but there are others where we have been led by um, academic, high profile academic PIs across the university. So, for example, Danny Schmidt, Professor Danny Schmidt has had a project called Vulnerability to Climate Change for UK Socioecological Systems. This is really looking at heat mapping and, and, and flooding in the Bristol region. Um, uh, working with local communities, with the um, uh, with the LEP and the uh, kind of local local government to understand areas of vulnerability and to a certain extent also lay the groundwork for predictive modelling. Uh, then Hen Wilkinson, Dr. Hen, Hen Wilkinson, who is a um, has recently been a, an EPSRC fellow embedded within. Um, the JGI. So I just want to give an example of of, of a kind of that kind of support we can offer as well. We can host. Um, we can host fellowships from people that win those funds from research councils. So Hen has been working on a number of projects, but the one where we've been kind of supporting with data science um, underpinning is her interdisciplinary peace tech group. So this is a network which has come together to explore how data science, AI and other kinds of tech can and is being used for peace building uh, not, and conflict resolution, not just in the UK, but, uh, but more widely internationally as well. So it's, this, is a, this, is, this is an international network. We have colleagues from Israel, from Belgium, from the States, all coming together, meeting monthly um, to discuss the issues that are important to us and the opportunities that there might be to operationalize some research around that. Um, so our next activity is a um, 
a two day uh, retreat where we're going to be getting together in person and, and thinking about funding for next steps. There is a website attached to that. If you're interested, we can share that with you in, in the chat. Um, and then some of the projects that we that we support are embedded in the faculties and we provide that technical aspect of support. So an example of that is the CARS project, which the, for which the, the Bristol PI is Professor Eddie Wilson from Engineering Mathematics. Uh, and this project is working to connect administrative vehicle data for research on sustainable transport. And um, that's a really interesting project because it relies on a collaborative partnership with government organisations. So in this case, the um, Department for Transport and, and DVLA. So negotiate, understanding how to negotiate the relationships, the research governance around data that 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 implies thinking about trusted research environments these are all really interesting aspects from the data science perspective uh, for a project like that with some really some really kind of close proximity to impact in terms of driving policy making um, as a similarly kind of high impact project is the next one on this list which is um, led by um, Phil Clatworthy and Richard Abitoye who are both um, academic clinical uh, lecturers uh, and also uh, embedded in practice uh, as, as neurosurgeons. Um, and this is a project which is, is looking at how we can pull multimodal data describing the patient experience, um, diagnose stroke patient experience, and use that as a to, to produce a dashboard for clinical, to support clinical decision making in the future. So again, this has been a really interesting project for us because again, we've been negotiating the relationships between the gatekeepers, the hosts of these different data, the patient community clearly being, being one of those very much embedded in, in the project as a whole, thinking about the outcomes. Uh, so we're one year into that two year project and we hope to be able to have, maybe this time next year, we'll be able to have a, a workshop or a session dedicated to that project, which would be great. And then the last four are, are just some which um, are, are kind of give you a snapshot of some of the other activities that we're doing. We're involved uh, looking at how e-scooters might be used um, to, um, to help monitor air pollution um, within cities. That's led by Dr. Sam Williamson in engineering and supported by James Thomas in our, in our JGI team. Um, we've supported um, some projects out there in the world with which JGI then doesn't have um, any um, ongoing responsibility, but we just provide the funds to support that growing network. So a good example of that is, um, is one around the fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, looking at data, um, how data, multimodal data might be pulled together into one repository to address issues around that. And that's led by Cheryl McGuire. Another example of a project like that, which has been led by the engineer in, the, in Bristol, Alberto Gambaruto, with very strong collaboration with the SS Great Britain Museum that many of you will know, thinking about how um, the degradation of the hull might be might be monitored and predicted and then ameliorated using non-destructive evaluation techniques and understanding airflow around the hull within the museum. Um, and then the last one I just put, I put in because I want to give an example of another really strong project from the arts faculty. So this was an attempt to use natural language processing to explore um, changes in the use of words, vocabulary and text within Sophocles plays and provide a tool for doing that. And this project was interesting um, because it was it developed a relationship with an external research software engineering company that had produced the dashboard um, uh, and and I and I think that was for the for the researchers that was a really valuable knowledge exchange process and I'm really glad to to, to say that the the PI Ben has has just been awarded a lectureship at a university in classics um, and I think is going to be tasked with developing digital humanities uh, when he when he moves off to Ohio so a, a really nice example of how a relatively small amount of funding can leave us some really wonderful network benefits for the researchers involved. We regularly run data competitions and we'll be we'll be running we'll be running some more coming up. But just to give you an example of a few of those, um, the beauty of data, Sebastian Steinig and, and the wonderful Wheel of Time Weather Globe. We've run projects with Ordnance Survey and the Secret Life of Data short story competition, which was another example of working with the arts faculty. Um, and we run a number of ongoing research support projects. So, for example, the JGI Harbour on data science seminars, our data hazards training, the research software engineering training that you're having, that, that as many of you will be having today, and data science for scientific computing training, as well as our good practice handbook. So all those are like a drumbeat in the background. 
Um, and the last one I want to focus on today is um, something that we're launching at Cheltenham Science Festivals this year, which is DataFace, bringing data to life for school children. Um, there have been many surveys of the kinds of skills that young people need today around information data, lit data literacy, communication and collaboration, understanding how to create content, understanding how to stay safe in an online world and using data science as a mechanism for problem solving, using it creatively um, and thinking about um, how we can get as diverse a group of people involved as possible. Because I think we're all aware that the, um, the narrative, the public narrative around AI in particular is at the moment largely one of fear rather than one of opportunity. And, and um, uh, I, I think there's a sense that um, we, need to, we need to work hard to encourage young people to engage in, these, in this work by understanding how what they can bring to it, that it is for them and that they can be empowered to grow the kind of data science and, and, and AI world and digital world that we want to see in the future. So we're very, we're very concerned to embed ourselves in projects which, which contribute in however small a way to that, to that wider ambition. So DataFace is a project which um, offers extracurricular training for year nine and 10 students to be able to engage with what I've called, what I would normally call here, the, the data science life cycle. How do you, how do you get data? What, what questions do we want to ask? What questions do young people want to ask about data information in the world? How do they access that? How do they curate it and understand how to use it? And then how do they communicate that to each other and to the wider world? And what skills can they bring working in teams to do that? And I think my, my main sense, having worked in this project for a few years, is that data skills genuinely are life skills for this generation, for Generation Z. Z. We, have, we have been working since 2020 on this project with Cheltenham Festivals, with Cyber First, with Amazon Web Services, more recently Cheltenham Borough Council and what's now DSIT was, was Bayes. Um, to put together a curriculum that teachers can use and students will enjoy to get their first steps in understanding how to manipulate data and how to then visualize the findings of their, of their work for each other and the, and the wider community. So the way it works is that we have we at JGI have, have curated four data sets from open source. And, and they are around sea level rise, the cost of living, gender equality in education and environmental protection. And those subject areas were chosen through consultation with children at school and the teachers that, that work with them. Um, so we then we then went away and actually it was James Thomas in, in the team at JGI that did all the hard work pulling those data together and creating spreadsheets which would be accessible for the students in the versions of Excel and Google Sheets that they have within their schools. Um, we also have an engagement with two data journalists, professional data, data journalists and data artists who are working with us to inspire these children to think about novel ways of exploring their findings and, and disseminating the findings that they have. We've provided ongoing support for those schools throughout the year of this programme. And at the end of year, the Cheltenham Science Festivals has hosted an exhibition and peer-to-peer -peer learning opportunity in person for them, which has been really, really valuable. And the exciting thing for this year is that we've just finished, supported by AWS, producing a whole series of bite-sized videos for school teachers and students aiming at this these year nine to 10, so 13 year olds, in core data schools, in introducing the four data sets and explaining data communication. Um, you won't see my face uh, on any of these videos, although I was involved in some of the creative content, uh, but because we really wanted to give opportunities for young early career researchers in data science and AI broadly understand, understood to present that, to be the faces uh, for the future, to be accessible to as many of these young people as possible. Um, I was hoping I was going to be able to show you one of these videos, but I, I, I haven't yet got the, the final sign off to do that. But we this time next year, we'll certainly be having a session 
collection, um, thinking about how those videos might be used and broadening um, the um, the kind of the partnership uh, around DataFace to include other cities and other uh, across the across the country. So the great thing about this DataFace project is that it encourages and enables young people to make the connections between the data skills that they need, their, their own creative talents, and real world impact um, out there. Uh, it's been one of the most exciting partnership building um, projects that for me that JGI has has been involved in. I'm extremely proud of it. After this talk, James and I are, are going up to Cheltenham to do a launch event uh, within the Science Festival as part of as part of Data Week. So we'll be talking about the opportunities for data science with young people and teachers um, from across across the West. So very much looking forward to that. So that's all from me. Um, do connect with us if you'd like to, to kind of join any of our groups. You want to join Ethics Club or um, you know, maybe even give a talk at, at another time. Just you know, be in touch. We'll, we're probably going to have a uh, our next round of Seacorn funding. It's normally advertised in the autumn for, for a deadline closer to, to Christmas, so maybe, maybe in November. So that's plenty of time for you to think about what you might want to do. And if you want any advice about that, do let us know. But we're here to provide a service really for you, the research community. Um, we have some ideas of how to do that, but we don't have all the ideas and we're very much, we very much hope that we can kind of grow a, a dialogue with you to achieve that. Uh, so from beh on behalf of all the JGI team, I hope you have a great day to week, drop into as much as you can, let us know, let us know what you think, suggest new things for next year, and um, I'm sure I'll see some of you on Thursday at, uh, at the Beacon. <laughs>